Is this the red Tory error? Most right wing labor leader ever? Yes. Who is here? Starmer. Not like us video came out. Brandon interview with Stephanopoulos. I fucked that up. I fucked that. I did not spell that correctly. As donors ask him to drop last day in Rocia. And now twitch.tv slash Asanavi. Do we have a meme? Do we have a meme for the blast off chat or not? Are you going to talk about Biden calling himself a black woman? I did yesterday, but I'll talk about it extensively today. Thank you for the playlist, Demacius. All right, boom. Posted and roasted. He's also said something about roadways before he lost his train of thought. Yeah, he's not doing too good, but we knew that already. Look at the front page of the New York Times. They're going all in on Mamala. It's Mamala time, baby. All right, Blamo, we did it. Labor won, UK. Labor won a UK landslide. Why doesn't it feel like that? A lot of a uh, lot of talk about the prime minister let's see the reintroduction of kamala harris oh my god it's below the fold but let me tell you tories were so ass scotland didn't even vote for its own guys dude it is pretty crazy seeing this fucking massive wave of support dude you finna talk about jeremy corbyn independent w or what yeah reform didn't do well as predicted shame that where i live voted for them wait what do you mean didn't do as well as predicted no they fucking did gangbusters what are we talking about dude what reform did un oh oh predicted as in 13 and only got five or four no but that's still guys guys in comparison to the exit polls they did uh way worse but it doesn't matter they they're still dude they still got millions of votes okay like it's like the British Nazi party getting millions of fucking votes. That's not reform one second in 98 seats. Like you cannot tell me that this is not legitimately troublesome. This is the British Nazi party, dude. It is fucking crazy. And here's why it's damaging. Okay. Here's why that that is incredibly damaging. Because immediately people start going, reform isn't as extreme as other right-wing parties in Europe. Like, like people are already doing, uh, people have this tendency without recognizing <clears throat> what they are doing to normalize extremist politics, okay? And this unfortunately never happens for leftist politics. It never happens for like socialism. It only happens for further and further reactionary right-wing politics and i don't even think that that guy is like secretly a fucking reform supporter or anything i just simply think that that guy is doing the predictable thing doing the predictable thing that many people do when they see a, a, a genuine cause for concern and then their first and their, their first reaction to this genuine cause of concern is not to analyze it and go, oh my God, this is damaging. This is terrifying. There's millions of people in our fucking neighborhoods that went and voted for, uh, went and voted for like out and about fucking fascists. Second place in 98 districts is unimaginably bad, especially because of what I said earlier that like the conservatives in order to launch a stronger opposition will most likely play the role of normalizing reform, normalizing reforms policies. You've seen this already happen with the AFD in Germany. You've seen this happen with Marine Le Pen, the, the nationalist, uh, the party in France, it starts off marginal. And then before you know it, two election cycles later, you're like, what the fuck's going on? How do we get here? And there's always people like myself who have been covering this stuff for years and years who is telling you every step of the way, this is imaginably scary. Reform nearly got half as many votes as labor. Quite worrisome here. Yeah, look at this. Labor's landslide victory definitely... Labor's landslide victory kind of muddies the waters given the way that like British politics works. In terms of... In terms of like what their actual performance in totality looks like okay their actual performance in totality is insanely scary in comparison to former labor uh former labor politics and former labor numbers 
okay? And also, when you look at something like this, okay? When you look at the vote numbers across the board, Reform UK got 4 million. They almost fucking reached the conservative number, dude. That is, like... Like, I don't know what to say. That is so terrifying. Okay? That is unimaginably terrifying. Like, that is a red alarm bell. That We're talking like we're nearing re-education camp territory, like, immediately. Okay? Like, someone's... Like, the British boomer class... The British boomer class is out of control, dude. They are so insanely reactionary. Okay? Yeah, this is what this is what's important to analyze. Like it's going to it's it's a thumping majority without a thumping share in the vote. What could possibly go wrong? Like Labour doesn't have the popular mandate that uh, that people think it has in terms of the actual the actual seat majority that it has. Okay, it's the lowest number of sitting conservatives in British history, dude. Dude, I don't think you understand. Conservatives are out. Okay, yes, and that's a good thing. 14 years of austerity, and finally the British people were like, bro, we are so fucking poor. What the hell's going on? These guys have fucked us. And I heard this five years ago, okay? Five years ago, it was nine years of Tory austerity. Something needs to change. Obviously, anyone was go anyone who was not, anyone who's the primary opposition party was going to win this election by a landslide. That's not the question here. That is not the interesting aspect of this election here. Everybody fucking knew that this was going to happen, okay? Like, Rishi Sunak and the conservatives were able to unite the British public against the conservative party, okay? Problem is, they said, we are so poor, and a large population then said, and immigrants are to blame. Yes, okay? This happened in Sweden. This happened in Nordic countries. This has been happening in Western Europe across the board, okay? Austerity creates more poverty for the and, and more economic inequality in the hands of neoliberal governance. And then people experience that economic instability and that volatility and they go, oh, I'm angry. And then there's one guy out there that says, you're angry. Look at those brown people. I think those are, that's the reason why you're angry, right? Or in, in the UK, it's not even just brown people. It's like, look at those Polish people. That's the reason why you're angry, right? And people go, you know what? You're right. Actually, it is the fucking Polish. That is the reason why I'm angry. I don't even, I don't even like their fucking food. What's this about? Okay. Or the Muslims. Oh my God. They're coming in numbers. They're coming in waves. Oh my God. They're coming in dinghies. Okay. It's the same story over and over again. And I think that, I think that this is legitimately fucking terrifying, especially when you consider that one, this is rather Pyrrhic in terms of a victory, regardless of the actual landslide in like seats. Okay. And not only that, it spells that you don't have the popular mandate. Okay. You don't have the, you don't necessarily have the popular mandate. And beyond that, you personally, Keir Starmer personally, has signaled that he will continue the, the uh, old school way, the, the Tory way of operating. Can a left take a W? I mean, we'll see what happens, okay? Because if Keir Starmer operates in the way that he actually operated, or in the way that he spelled he would operate, which is a continuation of privatization and no actual... Um, no actual cash infusions, no way to fix the economy, uh, and, and no genuine improvements in infrastructure, no, no, no additional spending on government-funded programs, whether it be the NHS, whether it be public transit. If he doesn't do that, and it doesn't seem like he's going to do that, the River Thames is going to be con continuing to, to fill up with shit. The railroads are continuing to get worse and worse, and people are still going to experience uh, a, a, an affordability crisis that has definitely been a major uh, issue in the UK across the board. Okay. Thames. Sorry. <sighs> this is convenient for the Tories. They can take this time to regroup and strengthen while the Tory in red clothing takes all the blame for a while, then the pendulum can swim back to them. Some democracy. Brother, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't think the pendulum is swinging back to them. I think the pendulum is swinging to a way more reactionary nationalism in the UK. 
I think that they are going to miscalculate and they're going to see this momentum and they're going to say, let's align with reform. Actually, we'll take their seats. Uh, look at the uh, massive amount of voters that they're able to capture. Let's align with them. Okay, let's collaborate with them. Let's adopt some of their more reactionary uh more reactionary influence, bring it into the party. The Tories are already pretty fucking reactionary. They're super right wing in general. Rishi Sunak literally was already doing that. Rishi Sunak was already doing that. The Rwanda protocol is literally like, it's, it's some unimaginable cruelty. It's like, it's so perfectly British. I feel like it's Winston Churchill, okay? Without the, the keep calm and carry on World War II, like, we lucked into the right side of uh, that that war politics, okay? It's insane. So we'll cover this in more detail in a second. Let's see the broader analysis. The government this morning threw out the ruling conservatives in a historic shift to the left. Labor Party leader Keir Starmer required the symbolic approval of King Charles to become the new prime minister after Rishi Sunak handed in his resignation. Sunak's defeat is nothing less than a total repudiation by the British public. MTS Tayeb has more from London. MTS, good morning. Good morning. Well, what a day in British politics, Nancy. After 14 years of conservative rule, which saw the party bitterly fracture over Brexit, multiple leadership changes, and erratic internal divisions during times of national emergencies like COVID and the cost of living crisis, British voters have had enough. I will also say that the global economic crisis across the board, like the global economic crisis in the Western world across the board, has basically been a repudiation of whoever is in power. Okay? This spells trouble for Biden's prospects across the board, even though, uh, you know, he has additional issues as well. But I will say, it doesn't matter who's fucking holding the reins. You know what I mean? Unless they are actually putting straightforward unless they're actually putting straightforward policy measures to combat the the affordability crisis in a meaningful way it doesn't matter what they call themselves people are going to be like no you're done it is basically yes it is basically a weird time where there is incumbent disadvantage okay it's odd it's not about like because because you see it you see it with macron in france okay center right Centrist neoliberal being absolutely cumstered. You see the Tories in the UK after 14 years get eviscerated. Okay. People are just like swinging. They're swinging at whatever they can. Mexico is a great example. Mexico, on the other hand, has put into uh, policy. Mexico has actually implemented certain policies that were broadly popular by the Mexican electorate, which is why they voted for the same party again, okay? Sure, there were a lot of issues, but that's why I said, unless there is a direct, unless there's something that your, your current government is doing that people see as like a legitimate way, a, a legitimate way to like try to stave off further issues, and if you are in the Western world, if you're in Western Europe, you definitely aren't doing enough because, you know, there's not a lot of momentum in that direction, not a lot of momentum in either direction, really. And uh, only the only changes that can come will happen in the direction of, of further right wing slants uh, within governance, uh, whether it be whether it be like raising the retirement age, whether it be, uh, you know, trying to trying to continue neoliberalism, trying to continue austerity in whichever way they possibly can while packaging it as like, well, this is the sane, reasonable thing to fucking do. Okay. <sighs> But if you look at the vote share, Labour and Lib Dems have more votes combined than Tory and Reform. Brother, Lib Dems? Like, what are we talking about? You think that, like, the OG Labour Party and Liberal Democrats are supposed to be aligned? Like, what are we talking about right here? What the fuck? Lib Dems. Last time Labour had a sur super majority with Tony Blair, he said he regretted not being more progressive. I feel that Labour will do the exact same thing. They'll. This man, Keir Starmer, as far as I understand... Unless he's been just like secretly faking it and he actually is a fucking socialist, but he's been secretly faking being a centrist in order to like, I guess, I don't know, in his own calculations, not uh, put the fear of God in a bunch of reactionary British voters. Unless he like changes course on what he has messaged thus far, 
Okay. I don't think he's going, I think he's going to be more right wing than fucking Tony Blair. I hope that's not the case, but it doesn't seem like, uh, it doesn't seem like I'm wrong so far. Anyway, let's continue. And as Big Ben strikes 10, the exit poll is predicting a labor landslide. Even before a single ballot was counted, it was clear Keir Starmer's Labour Party had won a massive majority. And as the vote counting went into the early hours, it was confirmed. We can now say with certainty that Labour have won the 2024 general election. For the Conservatives, the defeat wasn't just crushing, it was a near annihilation. The worst result faced by the party huh. in its 200-year history. Major figures out of jobs. I mean... Dude, dude, they deserve so much worse. I mean, I'm be, I'm be honest with you, like they deserve to be imprisoned. Okay? In the they should have this should have been nipped in the bud in the Thatcher era, okay? They should have just straight up done like a people's tribunal on the entirety of the conservative party and sent them off to the fucking mines, okay? Instead of privatizing said mines, they should have kept those mines, okay? They should have had state-funded mines that they shipped uh, Thatcher and all of the fucking Tories to and then done a serious re-education, okay? But they didn't. And the Tories have dominated British politics for a very long time. Specifically, the last batch was the past 14 years. And the UK became unimaginably poor, while also the British wealthy became unimaginably rich, which is, of course, exactly what happens both in America and every other fucking Western liberal democracy where you have people in positions of power whose job is specifically to do that, okay? You are joking, but I unironically support that. I, am I joking? Who said I'm joking? The only joke here is that I forgot to run the top of the hour ad break and I'm running it 16 minutes in, okay? That's the only joke. I wasn't joking when I said, send them to the fucking mines, okay? Anyway, the Green Party did get a lot of votes. They got four seats, two more than expected. So perhaps there's a silver lining here. I mean, yes and no. Look at the fucking Lib Dems, dude. Anyway, uh, here's the three-minute ad break now. Let's do that. Three-minute ad break at the top of the hour. If you no longer want to see those ads, all you need to do is subscribe for $5 or for free with a Twitch Prime by connecting your Amazon Prime account to your Twitch account where you get one free Prime subscription a month. Use it on your favorite broadcaster. You know I'm being serious when I'm talking about British politics, and I haven't done a, a variety of different British accents throughout this process, okay? This is me locked in. Do you understand? I'm taking this shit seriously, all right? I haven't even done a British accent yet. It's been an hour. The coverage has started. I'm talking about motherfucking British politics, and I've yet to do an accent. I just did. I know while I was serving the ad break. Anyway, let's continue. Go, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak soon conceded his party's brutal defeat. The British people have delivered a sobering verdict tonight. But the verdict was also fragmented, reflecting the deep dissatisfaction across Britain. Voter turnout was the second lowest since 1885, with Reform UK, an anti-immigrant party, gaining the third largest share of... Voter turnout was the second lowest since 1885 is the real sobering number. Okay? What the fuck? Dude, do they not vote? No, bro. Because labor sucks dick too. Is that good? Yeah. No, it's really good. They're, they're hitting America numbers. Oh, by the way, it's percentage, obviously. It's like percentage adjusted to the population. I'm just saying that, like, they're literally doing America right now, okay? It's crazy. And they don't even have a... They don't even have a fucking electoral college, which basically means that, like, many people in... Many people just have the reason not to vote. You know what I mean? I mean, I guess it's, like, first past the poll, so, like, that's one reason, Right? But even then, anyway, first past the post. Votes. Is it first the past the poll? First past the post voting system left it with just four seats. Still, its leader, Nigel Farage, the right wing populist ally of former President Trump, won his. The Green Party, as well as independent candidates who ran on platforms to end the war in Gaza, also managed to nab formerly safe seats from Labour. You campaigned for it, you fought for it, you voted for it. And now it has arrived. Change begins now. Still, the sheer size of the Labour landslide gives Keir Starmer the most decisive of mandates. After 14 years in the political wilderness, 
Labor is back, and Keir Starmer is now Prime Minister. And with Keir Starmer now the latest occupant of 10 Downing Street, he's a Prime Minister who's inherited a fragile economy, crumbling infrastructure, and a disillusioned public. It's now his job to try and fix it all. Oh. Dude, England is so cooked. Like, dude, it, it, it is actually really fucking bad. It is actually really, really fucking bad. Like, when I say England is so poor, it's like, it's not normal, dude. It's like, we're talking Alabama poverty, okay? Bro, when I heard that the, oh, fuck, I, was it on, it was either on True and On or Chapo, there was a British correspondent they had on, talk about how, like, some hospitals in the UK can't have fat people on the second floor. I lost my fucking mind. Because, like, the ground will collapse because of the short term, uh, the short term concrete that they used and then just kept instead of like beefing up their infrastructure in the hospitals, they just like basically left it and now it's rotting. So you can't even, so you can't even have fat people on the second floor. That's insane, man. It's just like, what are we doing here? What has become of the supposed superiority of the Western world? All these fucking people cope and talk about like western world is crumbling western civilization is crumbling because of gay people it's like no dude your fucking concrete is crumbling okay like what are you talking about what do you mean none of your fucking trains work the fuck are you talking about dude china is literally building high-speed rail everywhere dude everywhere you go to asia Every fucking country, you go to Africa, they're building shit non-fucking stop. Meanwhile, the UK can't even build their goddamn hospitals. And people are like, oh, the Western world is collapsing. It's like, because of gay people. Yeah, dude, it's gay people that's collapsing the fucking Western world. And it just is fucking falling apart, man. What the hell's going on? It was supposed to be a point of pride. Anyway. This is important to understand as well. Keir Starmer received fewer votes than Jeremy Corbyn did in both 2017 and 2019. Remember, Mr. Unelectable. In 2017, he got more votes. In 2019, he got more votes. Mr. Fucking Unelectable. Okay? That's because Labor didn't gain a lot of supporters in that time. Conservatives just lost a lot. No, the major... Yes, conservatives did lose a lot. But the major problem here... The major problem here is that... Given the crisis within the conservative party, Starmer should be cooking, okay? Starmer should be fucking cooking. Like, what are we talking about? He's the guy, right? He's the method. He's the movement. That's the way they presented it. The way that they presented Keir Starmer was that he was the great fucking Just through these things. He was going to make How Britain Became a Poor Country from Tom Nicholas. We will definitely watch this in a little bit, okay? Here's the UK food bank users, dude. Shit is mint. I mean, maybe they just open up more food banks. I don't know. Data lies sometimes, but like even then. Not with Kid Starver in charge, dude. <laughs> that shit's going to go down. Trust. <laughs> as in, he's just going to close them off. Anyway, shouldn't we support Keir Starmer as a visionary leftist, nevertheless, who led to the UK finally back to leftism? <sighs> yes, a visionary leftist. He's a, he's a revolutionary Stalinist, actually. He's a revolutionary Marxist. I'm super stoked for the UK. He is finally, he's sending Rishi Sunak to a labor camp. I'm not even kidding. Most people would say yes to that. If there was a referendum on, should we send Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak and Boris Johnson and prominent figures in the conservative party into labor camp, you would have 98%. You'd have Bashar al-Assad numbers on that referendum. Okay. It, it's not even a question. Cause like, even the fucking Tory voters hate them. So, you know, there you go. They'd be like, yeah, no, send their asses to the fucking labor camps. Let's go. Rishi Sunak to Rwanda. <laughs> that would get 100% from uh, the, the reform party because they're like, oh, one less brown guy. Thank you. They would be like, yes, 100%. 100% of like the, the 4 million, however many million people fucking voted for reform would say yes to that. 4 million people united for different reasons. Yeah, send him home to Rwanda or whatever nation he's from. I don't care. Okay. All right. Labor wins by a landslide. Let's look at the, the Starmer uh, versus Blair versus Corbyn comparisons. Starmer is going to essentially <laughs> more or less match what Tony Blair achieved in 1997 when it comes to seats in Parliament.
But here's what's interesting. Look, this is how many votes across the country, how many people voted for Tony Blair and how those votes stacked up over the course of the count. Let's just compare that with what we've just seen for, uh, for um, Keir Starmer. Just have a look at that. OK, so that is the number of votes that Keir Starmer has achieved. And just look at how far short it is of, what, of the number of people who voted for Tony Blair in 1997. It's even short of the number of people who voted for Jeremy Corbyn in 2017, who obviously didn't even get uh, into government. And so you can call that what you want. You can call it a change in the voting system. Well, certainly a representation of uh, the voting system. You can call it efficiency. Whatever you call it, though, it is a thumping majority without a thumping share in the votes. Yeah, I give two years before people are calling him Harris Starmer. I think he's going to be a Macron-style figure that causes so much disdain towards labor and, and bring about the fucking fourth right in the UK. That's my, that's my prediction. I hope I'm wrong. I really, really, really hope I'm wrong. But I'm telling you right now, it feels like we're at the precipice. If Keir Starmer continues with austerity, if Keir Starmer continues with privatization, if Keir Starmer continues with conservative policies with a fucking red, with a red sticker on it, okay? I'm telling you, I'm telling you, if he does that, we're talking reform UK, whatever the fuck it is. Maybe reform takes over the conservative party entirely. Maybe it's just simply reform. You are looking, you're staring at the barrel of a goddamn gun, okay? You are staring down fascist mobilization in the UK like you've never seen. If he continues this, now I, maybe he doesn't. Maybe he was lying this entire time in his entire election campaign he was just lying and he's secretly a committed marxist leninist and he's going to do unimaginable good okay maybe maybe that would be incredibly hopeful <laughs> i just don't think that he would do that especially considering what the party looks like now what the labor party looks like now in comparison to where it was under uh, Jeremy Corbyn, what they did specifically to like Corbyn, Corbynites, and anyone who's like ostensibly a real leftist in the fucking Labor Party. Um, uh, you know, Starmer as a white hat centrist is hilarious. Yeah, he just like faked it. He faked being a centrist, and now you will see the real, the real red Labor wave is actually red for communism. The, uh, the spirit, the specter of communism is haunting the UK. Okay sun broke out as the new occupants of number 10 arrived on Britain's most famous street. The welcome was warm for Keir and Victoria Starmer. His first words a tribute to the man who just departed. I want to thank the outgoing Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. His achievement as the first British Asian Prime Minister of our country, the extra effort yeah, dude, <laughs> it was so wonderful. It made the already racist British people significantly more racist. <laughs> uh, he wasn't voted in, I know. It doesn't even matter. That will have required should not be underestimated by anyone. And we pay tribute to that today. And we also recognize the dedication and hard work he brought to his leadership. But now our country has voted decisively. Yeah, dedication and hard work to further fucking up the country. The dedication and hard work to, like, leaning into some of the most unimaginably reactionary white nativist immigration policies. Despite being, like, an Asian dude. Despite being a brown dude, okay? Like, Rishi Sunak's last-ditch effort was literally like, let's just kill migrants. <laughs> and if we don't kill them, let's fucking just ship their ass to Rwanda. What an insane move, dude. That was crazy. Like, he's like, oh, are we losing? Um, I see, I'm assuming they have internal polls. Uh, I assume that they have, like, internal polls that were showing that, like, reform is, like, you know gaining momentum or whatever and then his his uh his his misdirection or his like party redirection was like oh are you guys really poor are you really angry about the affordability crisis are people gonna fucking die in the heat due to heat strokes are people going to fucking food banks uh by massive numbers now 
Well, you know, let's just kill a couple migrants. Call it a day. <laughs> Sick. That seems good. That seems like a great idea. For change, whether you voted Labour or not, in fact, especially if you did not, I say to you directly, my government will serve you. Our work is urgent. We begin it today. Thank you very much. His triumph is both historic and strange. The first Labour Prime Minister in 14 years enters Downing Street with a thumping majority, but his landslide lacked luster, secured with fewer votes than Jeremy Corbyn got in 2019. It happened because the Conservatives experienced their worst ever defeat. Leaving his post earlier under more leaden skies, Rishi Sunak was heavy with humility. To the country, I would like to say first and foremost, I am sorry. I have given this job my all, but you have sent a clear signal that the government of the United Kingdom must change, and yours is the only judgment that matters. Whilst he has been my political opponent, Sir Keir Starmer will shortly become our Prime Minister. In this job, his successes will be all our success. He said, who want me? <laughs> and everyone was like, not me, bitch. <laughs> who want me right now? Who want me? Yes or no? You want me? Nope. Why is she standing like that? Yeah, what the fuck's going on in the background, dude? I love the, the Democrat-style rhetoric coming from Starmer, by the way. Did you guys pick up on that? Oh, to all the naysayers, I'm going to serve you. That is verbatim what Joe Brandon said when he won. Like, that is such classic, classic Democratic Party mealy mouthed liberal lib shit bullshit okay oh yeah so to those who don't believe in me i will serve you perhaps the most which is like what are you saying dude no no don't say that okay anyway yeah english public on rishi sunak tiktok this is a great tiktok i know exactly what this is because it's this is basically election. excuse me sir have you got a message for rishi sunak fuck off hey, fuck, fuck off. off fuck off I get the fuck. He's a knob. He's a prick. He's a, he's a cunt. <laughs> Have you got a message for Rishi Sunak? Who? The mm. Prime Minister. Ah, fuck him. Fuck off. Anyway, that's like... That's the, the overwhelming attitude from the British towards this administration. Okay? So if you're wondering how these election results uh, came to be, that's, you know, there you go. That's and I wish him and his family well. Whatever our disagreements in this campaign, he is a decent, public-spirited man who I respect. Both leaders gracious in victory and defeat. It was a very British exchange of power. Mr Sunak will stand down as Tory leader once the arrangements for his successor are in place. He headed to the palace to resign, ahead of Keir Starmer being commissioned to form a government by the king. This momentous day came after an extraordinary night. Who's worse, Tories or Republicans? I mean, come on, dude. The American Republican Party is already the fucking Nazi party. What are you talking about? Like, it's bad and worse. Like, the, the Tories are fucking awful, but, like, that's not a... Dude, Tories are awful, okay? They're awful. But, like, the Republican Party is historically one of the worst parties of all time, okay? There is nothing even remotely redeemable not that there is anything remotely redeemable about the tories either but like come on reform or republicans you just that's reductive reform is the american republican party but in the uk okay anyway these these kinds of conversations are kind of silly in general because they need to be adjusted to like american politics american material conditions like it's very different both cabinet ministers unseated and Liz Truss, ousted as prime minister after 45 days, now rejected by her constituents, losing one of the safest Tory seats in Britain. Conservative nightmare complete as their longtime tormentor, Nigel Farage, has become an MP. Heckled by a series of protesters, but his party reform got four million votes, although due to the electoral system, only a handful of seats to show for it. It is very much my view that our outdated, first-past-the-post electoral system is not fit for purpose, and we will campaign with anyone and everyone to change this electoral system. 
With fewer votes than reform, the Lib Dems obtained vastly more seats. It was a night of sweet success for Ed Davey. Morning of sober reflection. Trust is a very precious commodity. It's hard <coughs> won. And sometimes you've lost it, you lose it. And you have to work very hard to win it back. And I want to thank people for trusting us again. We will not let you down. The Scottish nationalists lost big as Labour rebuilt its red wall north of the border, while the Greens picked up a record four seats. This afternoon, we saw the procession of new faces of government walking up Downing Street, a female deputy prime minister in Angela Rayner, a female home secretary in Yvette Cooper, and the first ever female chancellor, Rachel Reeves. It is a dramatic changing of the guard with a party whose big promise is to change Britain. Jason Farrell, Sky News. 60% voter turnout is crazy. There's only two gen... Are you kidding me? Welcome to America, baby. What are we talking about? <laughs> Yo, they're hitting... They're hitting America numbers out there, dude. It's awesome. Loki Cures needs to implement nationwide grants for AC installment and all housing. It's the only way. I mean, that's one of the immediate things he needs to do. It's not even a joke. Like, I'm not... The AC situation is not a fucking joke. I'm not even kidding. Like, England needs to come to the first world a little bit on that front. I mean, this is the... There's death. There's actual death in this country. I love how reforms first moves to question the election results. No fucking way. They did that. That's awesome. I didn't even know that. All right. Uh, we just watched that video. Let's do... Um, before we get to... Uh, before we get to the, the, the um, you know, American conversation... Here's uh, Corbin and his message to the centrists. Your, on your win, um, do you want to congratulate Keir yeah. Starmer? It's a fantastic win we've achieved here tonight in Islington North. It's a popular win where people have come forward to support an inclusive democratic campaign. It's a people-powered campaign, and I'm very, very proud of our result. Obviously, it's a Labour government elected. Congratulations on that. I will be an independent MP. That's what I've been elected as. And I will be there holding that government to account, holding that government to account on issues of child poverty, of mental health, and of global peace and environmental demands. And that is what the people of Islington North have asked me to do. But it's also a very strong message that if you tread on democracy within your own party, it has consequences. And so tonight, the people of Islington North have spoken and elected me with 24,000 votes. But it isn't the message, in fact, that when you take the Labour Party to the centre, it wins a landslide. Uh, and if that means, you know, you're, you're on the edges of it, Sometimes supporting it, sometimes criticising it, well, so be it. It's a landslide, yes, in seats, but it is a lower vote than has been achieved in many previous elections. It's only 37% of the national poll, and our political system exaggerates um, parliamentary majorities because of first-past-the-post system. Now, maybe that's a debate for another day, but it comes with it. A huge responsibility. We live in a country which is dominated by the power of billionaires and the poverty of millions. I think we need to change that, and I'm not convinced that the Labour manifesto is... Oh my god. It's like, dude, 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 it's like, if you're British watching this right now, if you're like a labor voter watching this right now, it's got to feel like, like you fucked up. Like this is the ex, this is the ex that got away and you're just watching them thrive in some ways. And you have to be really reconsidering like what, how, how things turned out the way that they did. Cause I 100% believe that Corbyn would have the broad popular mandate in this situation. Oh my God, what a beautiful moment it would be for the UK. Comic offer will be able to deliver the fundamental changes our society needs. So I'll be a voice, a voice to try and bring about greater equality and opportunity for everyone in our society, particularly young people. Let us just bring in a couple of the people around our table. We have Harriet Harman and Alistair Campbell. And I'm sure they're both keen to talk to you. Harriet. Well, I think you make the changes that Jeremy says that he espouses by having Labour as the party in government, not by having somebody standing against the party as a maverick on the back benches. And I think, you know, we've always stood for in the party collective endeavour. Sometimes things go our way, sometimes they don't, but collective endeavour on behalf of the people of the country as a whole. And what Jeremy Corbyn has done is stood out just as an individual and put himself as an individual above social progress for the country as a whole. And I, you know, I just don't agree with that. I would never do that put my own interests above the party and the good the party can do the country. So I'm disappointed in you, Jeremy, but I expect that's nothing new. Well, thank you for what you just said there. I don't know what to say. There are so many things I want to say,
and I am severely limited by the restrictive terms of service on Twitch.tv, you will never stop me from thinking the things that I am thinking, but I cannot say it. All I will say is, I do not like what she said. It made me upset. Like, it made me very, very upset. Anyway, let's continue. People of Islington North simply voted for me because we put forward a positive, inclusive campaign, because we offered hope of real change, and also we stood up for democracy within our society when the Labour Party's machinery... I love that. This cunt is fucking cunt, yeah? In her mind, what Jeremy Corbyn is supposed to do is just die. Like, like it's not like he was being selfish. Like, she's like, oh, how unimaginably rude that you ran against labor when they gutted you, when they fucking shanked you, when they deliberately tried to tank the party. Like, what was he supposed to do? Just die? It's really inappropriate that you didn't kill yourself, Jeremy Corbyn. Really, how... How incredibly cruel and selfish of you. Like, what are you saying? What are you fucking saying right now? Many chatters probably don't know the history. But Jeremy Corbyn was specifically, specifically gutted under his leadership internally within the Labour Party. The current administrative, the, the, current, the current people who are controlling the Labour Party specifically were deliberately tanking the Labour Party because they did not want Jeremy Corbyn... They did not want Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party to actually gain momentum, okay? The people that fucked him over and deliberately thwarted his chances are now in power, okay? I'm not just talking about calling him an anti-Semite, okay? I'm not just talking about that, which is one part of it. Gear Starmer played a role in that. I think, I think that with all of that in mind, and I do want to kind of... I don't know. I, I do want to kind of look into that a little bit today. I do want to, I, I, when you, when you consider all of the things that they did, okay. When you consider all the things that they did internally, when you consider how they fucking shanked this man, okay. For being a real one, there's no other way to put it. Okay. Real like Joe Manchin and Kirsten cinema hours over here. But then now the entire party is like Kirsten cinema, Joe Manchin. I know the labor files is the entire documentary on it. Uh, my point is, my point is, what was he supposed to do? Just fucking quit public life altogether? Like, after an entire, after decades of service, he was supposed to just quit because, like, they fucked him over? Insane. Shut the fuck up. Suck my dick. Saying that it's, like, messed up that he even ran against labor as an independent is insane after what labor did to him, okay? Was destroying democracy in Islington North. Jeremy Salas here, would you hope that one day, uh, like me, having been expelled from the Labour Party, that you'd get back into it? Listen, uh, Alistair, we've uh, just had an election. I've been elected as an independent MP. I am very much part of the wider Labour movement. I've been a trade unionist all my life, and I'll be a trade unionist to the day I die. And um, I will obviously be uh, campaigning and working with people both inside and outside the Labour Party. But I've been elected as an independent, and that's the mandate I've been given. J Jeremy, it's, it's Rory coming in here. Um, are, you, are you worried that Labour's going to come in with a kind of mini-austerity? They're signing up to £18 billion pounds worth of spending cuts. They're ruling out any additional borrowing. They're ruling out tax rises. How are they going to be able to invest in public services and get the country going again if they're running on an austerity package? I think you've taken us straight to the kernel of the problem. If the Labour manifesto... Doesn't I can't believe I'm saying this, but, but he's, that question is actually really good. He's absolutely right. And that is precisely the reason why I've been fucking so critical. This is the reason why I'm so unimaginably critical of fucking Keir Starmer. I fought... Because their fucking mandate is, is just Tory light. Not even Tory light, it's just straight Tory. It's really fucked up. Does offer any substantial changes either in taxation or in redistribution of wealth within our society? Then how on earth can you bring about the social changes that are needed? Or are you going to go down the road of further wage freezes on top of the 20% in the living standards of the poorest people over the past 15 years? People vote for change and they expect to get it. So I would imagine there's going to have to be some serious hearts searching about the economic direction in which this government is going to go. Because if it doesn't deliver fundamental change, there's going to be a lot of very angry people out there. Jeremy, can I ask you one other question? What, what, if you were still the leader of the Labour Party, what would you do 
to handle what seems to be one of the developing stories this evening, which is that there is something of the rise of the radical right in this country. What, in your view, is the best way for the Labour Party to tackle that? Send them to the mines, baby. Send Nigel Farage and the Tories to the fucking mines, okay? We need to increase our agrarian output. That's what I would say. We need, we need re-education camps. We need labor camps. Okay? Get the mines back running. Fix the economy by making every lord serve a sentence in the fucking mines. I'm talking a lot about sending people to mines because I'm in Croatia. And I got, you know, partisans on the mind a little bit. That's probably part of the reason. It's just, yeah, th throw them in the cuck pit. Good question, uh, Alistair, if I may say so. The rise of the far right across Europe and the titanic struggle that's now going, going on in France with the second round voting this Sunday is very, very serious. The far right has risen because uh, centre parties have moved to the right to try and mop up the support of the far right. Social democratic and centrist parties have moved a bit to the right with them. And we've had some appalling examples of blaming refugees, blaming migrants, blaming boat people that have made a perilous journey to try and get to a place of safety, as if they're the cause of the social problems of our society. Let's stop blaming minorities and start looking at the fundamental inequalities of our society. The message I put out throughout this uh, campaign in my own constituency of Islington North is I am not getting into that of blaming people who've come for example, from Bangladesh or somewhere else. I'm instead saying, bring people together so we solve our problems together. And I think the rise of the far right is dangerous. You won't beat the far right by conceding the ground to the far right. You have to make a stand against their horrible message of hate. and. How can you not love this guy? How can you not love this fucking guy, dude? I mean, how could I not love this man? He's just, he's just right. No notes. He's so right. It's not like he's saying something like, totally out of pocket here it's not like this is an insane assessment to make it's the correct assessment to make you don't have to be a fucking astute observer to be able to recognize that you don't have to be brilliant to recognize that he's just right that's it jeremy just just finally before we lose you i, I just want to fill in the viewers on the fact that um johnny mercer has lost his seat and trace coffee former cabinet minister has also lost her seat um but i just want to finally ask you also about labor's position on israel gaza which has been costly to the party tonight. Jonathan Ashworth has lost his seat. Other people are in trouble over it. What's the lesson? Well, the lesson is that people are appalled when they see the pictures of the destruction of Gaza. Yeah, also, Corbyn, right now, I mean, he'd be fucking getting absolutely cumstered by British media, but low-key, given the attitude that the British population has towards Israel right now, that is another moment of pure vindication. He literally would be the perfect labor candidate. He would get constantly fucking yelled at for anti-Semitism and whatnot. But right now, imagine him leading the fucking labor party. Like if he was able to, if he was able to like actually fucking weather the storm. Oh my God. She's so fucking right, dude. It may, excuse me. God damn. I got chills. Um, she's deaf, uh, chatters. Don't be fucking assholes here and don't be ableist. It is just like, Dude, he is, I mean, r across the board, he's better than Bernie Sanders. And you know my opinions on fucking Bernie Sanders, okay? I have loved uh, Jeremy Corbyn for a very long time. I think he's fucking incredible. His only issue is that he's too much of a, he's too much of a fucking pacifist. And he didn't have that dog in him. Like, he's the type of person who will commit to a cause and will put his literal body on the fucking line. Um, it doesn't matter, but he, but he's not like, he's not as vicious as he needs to be because British politics is filled to the brim with sharks. Is he like UK Bernie? He's better than UK Bernie. He's better than Bernie. Okay. Um, oh, she has palsy. She's not deaf. Okay. My bad. Um, regardless, um, I'm not super familiar with this, but why do people accuse Jeremy Corbyn of being anti-Semitic? Because he is, uh, he has an infallible record. So that was the only mechanism of attack for Corbyn because he's always been a pro-Palestinian voice in a sea uh, of, of dissent, in a sea of unified pro-Israeli sentiment. The UK is, in many respects, even worse than America, I would say, in terms of its media and in terms of its, like, um, in terms of its Israel support. It is, 
it has the same motivations, I think, that the United States has in terms of like, just like it has the same motivations with NATO, like they're selling a lot of weapons. There's a lot of trade. There's a lot of like economic collaboration and cooperation within the UK and obviously in the United States of America between like US and, and Israel, UK and Israel. Um, it's, uh, it's just, I mean, to be fair, to be fair, British people are responsible for Israel. You know, they did create it. So I think that should probably help you understand it. So like, so it, it especially at a time when like Corbyn has been such an outspoken advocate saying things like we should be more reasonable about Hezbollah. You know what I mean? Like that's, that's like completely within, that is completely outside of the bounds of reason for like anyone over the age of 40, even especially back then when he said that, you know what I mean? Like, like nowadays, there is a lot more leeway for Palestinian emancipation. Like demonstrating that kind of sentiment is actually no longer a burden, but a benefit. But back then it was like, what are you saying? Like, that's crazy. You hate Jews. Like that was the, that was what they hit him with. It's because he was right. He was right. He was always right. He is right. And he was right. Uh, and and obviously that's part of the reason like him exhibiting that bravery at a time uh, when many people were too cowardly to say anything I I personally think is um, you know I I just I always I'll tell you this much there are a lot of leftists who I cooperate with who I appreciate there are a lot of like you know center left leftist progressive commentators there's always a voice in the back of my mind because I always look back at how they treated Jeremy Corbyn. Someone said Mehdi Hassan. That's a good example. Okay. That's a good example. Mehdi Hassan kind of has to do that because he was like a little bit too much of a fundamentalist back in the day. So that past haunts him uh, in British uh, politics in general. So he like, I'll give him more leeway than like Owen Jones for the most part. You know what I mean? Like there are, there are a lot of people that at the time absolutely fucking played into the anti-Semitism shit. I never fucking caved. I never, I, I thought that that was like an insane, I, I thought it was an unimaginable cruelty and an unimaginable wrong uh, to, to put on a person who has dedicated his entire life to fighting against the apartheid in South Africa, fighting against the apartheid in, fighting against the apartheid in, uh, uh, in Israel. So anyway. Isn't designating a country for an ethnicity of people most insanely racist and freakish thing you can do? Yeah. Yep. You and I called out the bullshit the entire time. It was always bad faith. Not only was it bad faith, but it came to America. They tried to... The, the Democratic majority for Israel is literally owned and operated by the same fucking people that did this shit to Corbyn in the UK. And they tried to do it to Bernie Sanders. Obviously, Americans are too stupid to understand that, like, yes, uh, a Jewish person could very well be anti-Semitic. But this time it was for good. Uh, so no one was, so every American was like, what are you talking about? He's Jewish. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> but they did do that to Rashida Tlaib, Ilhan Omar, many others. <laughs> not to say that Bernie Sanders is anti-Semitic, by the way. Of course, I'm not saying that. I'm just simply saying that like, yes, a Jewish person can absolutely be anti-Semitic. Ben Shapiro exists. Um, but you know, Americans are too stupid to recognize that. And it kind of uh, backfired on the democratic majority for Israel at the time. So anyway, let's continue. You have with Corbyn a moment ago. What did you say? Um, so we was experiencing homelessness here in Islington and uh, the council offered me a property, but it was taking forever to- Bro, I'm telling you, Corbyn is like, Corbyn is like a, like a once in a lifetime figure. I don't know, I, I glaze him a little too much. Like I don't really, you never hear me glaze a politician like this, okay? He has stories like this by the thousands, okay? Like, he has, you fucking go up to a person and be like, what do you think about Jeremy Corbyn? They'll be like, I was homeless, and he gave me a house. <laughs> like, it's not even just, like, his his broader, you know, policy prescriptions or anything, which I obviously align with. It's like, he's also an unimaginably nice guy. An unimaginably nice guy. Okay? He would never serve the three-minute average at the top of the hour, unlike me. Why is he better than Bernie? Just wondering because his positions on his positions on the Israeli apartheid is unshakable. Did he recently get into electoral politics as an elected? What? He's been a fucking he, what? No, dude, he's been an MP since like the eighties. <laughs> no, or nineties. I don't know exactly when he started, but no, dude, he's been around for a very long time. What the fuck?
You know, Bastani misses leg day. Listen, I'm not going to hit him with that. He used to be super fucking yoked, and he's getting back into it. He's getting back in shape. I like it. Um, and at the same time, we were fleeing domestic abuse, and I was stuck in this flat, and obviously we was unsafe. So I emailed um, Jeremy Corbyn directly, and he spoke to the council. Oh, yeah. Also, like I said, at the, at the top of the hour, there's a three-minute ad break. So that is, the, that is what's going to happen to you. If you no longer want to see those ads, all you need to do is subscribe for $5 or for free with Twitch Prime. His story is like some revolutionary propaganda. He's always there for the least fortunate. He dedicated his life to just making people's lives better. Yeah, it's like, it seems stupid. Like, it, it seems surreal how nice of a person he is. And now we have this beautiful two-bed um, council property, but it's like a, a converted house. It's so gorgeous, and it's in a nice area. And it's like from where we came from to this now, and it was because of him. I <laughs> promise that you weren't canvassing. You just happened to pass I by and... Dude, that's so, dude, it, it's crazy. He, she said, Jeremy Corbyn saved me from like homelessness and domestic abuse, dude. And it's not a unique story. There are so many stories like this. This man does this shit literally in his free time. God, he's so amazing. I love him so much. And I'm so fucking angry. I will never forgive England for what they did to him. Okay. This is the type of shit they did to him. Rachel Riley defends Corbin t-shirt and thanks fans for support. Jeremy Corbin is a racist endeavor is the fucking t-shirt that she posted. You know what he was actually holding up? You know the placard that he was actually holding up in the original photo? Oh my God, this article doesn't even show the original photo. Oh my God, Rupert Murdoch needs to be launched into the fucking sun on a one-way ticket, dude. Are you fucking kidding me? Like, Sky News, you guys are such fucking demons, bro. Oh my lord, it doesn't even show the original photo? Are you serious? That's crazy, that's crazy. It's, it's literally, they buried the lead. Oh my god, the image has been edited from an original photograph of Mr. Corbyn being arrested at a London protest against racism in South Africa back in 1984, during his first year as an MP. It's not even in the article, that is like literally, oh my god, even when they're like trying to defend it. Murdoch doesn't own Sky News UK. Oh, really? I thought it was still owned by the Murdochs. Whatever. It doesn't matter. They're demons nonetheless. Defend the right to demonstrate against apartheid is what he was fucking being arrested for. Yeah. Demonstrate apartheid. Demonstrate against apartheid. Join this picket. When was this photo taken? 1984. One year into him being an elected uh, MP. Oh. We love you with all our hearts. Oh, thank you, darling. With well, your support. Also, the Americans. We are with you. See, total loss American Latinos. Yes, it's, it's Voto Palahanamias, okay? Dude, he's so... Oh, my God. He's such a fucking... He is the prototype, dude. He is the prototype. He is the, he is the guy. He is that dude. He is that bitch, bro. He is that bitch. How often a, a day are you being stopped by people? And I know it's always happened because you're the MP. But... Every two minutes. Yeah, I bet. Is that a problem in terms of campaigning? Yeah. Yeah, disrupting but, you constantly. But you actually meet more people walking around the streets than you do knocking on doors. Hello. We've been walking, I swear to God, 100 meters, stopped four times. Hey, how you doing? It's crazy. The right wing press used his earrings as an MP as an attack in 2019. Brother, the right wing press literally said that him biking everywhere was because he's a Maoist. Okay, do you understand how fucking horny they were for him? They said he has a Maoist bike. You think I'm joking? Let's look it up. Okay, Corbin Maoist bike. Jeremy Corbin hits back at the press from asteroids to Maoist bicycles. Revealed how Jeremy Corbin welcomed the prospect of an asteroid wiping out humanity, attacked pigeon prejudice, and demanded a ban on Action Man toys. Revealed the evil monster haunting Jeremy Corbyn's past. Mar is snubbed for a day at church. Where's the fucking, uh, where's the, where's the Maoist bicycle thing? I remember seeing it at the time. It was incredible. I think it's one of those articles, like literally. It was the subtitle in the Times. The new Labour leader treated himself to a black cab at his home yesterday, abandoning his Chairman Mao styled bicycle his neighbors always see him riding. Other than that, Jeremy Corbyn treated much of the weekend like any other. You can see here, Jeremy Corbyn eating a sausage, much like Stalin would. Sausages, a Stalin-style sausage he was eating. They, yep, they said he was 
anti-Semitic because he said Epstein instead of Epstein, okay? They said he was anti-Semitic because he said Epstein. That's not even a dude, 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 dude. These people, these people are not even like they were not playing around. That's when I truly realized, like I always knew, I always knew that like British media sucks, right? I never knew how bad it was. I'm telling you, that's why for years and years, I've told you since this shit happened, I told you for years and years, like if you think the American press is bad, like British press is fucking so much worse, dude. Piers Morgan, whose show I go to all the fucking time, you need to understand something. That motherfucker was investigated for like hacking into the Royals phones, bro. They do not play around over there. They are fucking insane. British media is fucking insane, dude. But not the Royals phone, a dead girl's phone. <laughs> anyway. In every election for the past 40 years as a Labour candidate, this time I'm denied that. So I'm offering my services as an independent <laughs> in Islington North. I hope you'll be able to support me. I'm looking forward to the PhDs that are going to be written, that are going to analyze what happened in the Labour Party, that welcome Tory MPs who had voted for all of the horrible legislation introduced by David Cameron, Theresa May, Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak. I exclude Liz Trust from that, she didn't have time to introduce anything. They've been welcomed, whereas Labour MPs like me have been removed from the party. Doesn't that say something about the principles on which we're operating? When I stepped down as leader of the Labour Party, the party membership was hovering around 600,000. The largest membership. It the, problem with the, the problem with the dynamic that Corbyn brought to the Labour Party was that like the youth vote was college students and a shit ton of like young he brought a shit ton of young voters to the labor party okay at a time when all of the labor strongholds were suffering massively due to obviously at the time nine years of tory austerity and this created a fissure within the party okay which the centrist center right labor uh labor party lib dems basically took advantage of okay it was, I mean, this is like, um, Brexit sentiment is exactly what I'm talking about. That is the fissure. Obviously, London youth vote for Labour was understandably anti-Brexit. I myself am anti-Brexit. I was very openly anti-Brexit. There were other leftists in America who were not in agreement with me. My friends who were not in agreement with me. I thought that Brexit was fucking stupid. It was foolish. It was reactionary nonsense. Okay. But there was a shit ton of labor voters in the fucking strongholds, old school labor, lifelong labor voters who are now in, in dire economic circumstances that wanted Brexit to happen, that wanted Brexit to happen. And Jeremy Corbyn was stuck without a good position on Brexit. That is probably what did him in on top of the anti-Semitism shit. Wait, what? There were leftists who were pro-Brexit? That sounds wild to me. No, that's not wild at all. Anyway. It's ever had. Money wasn't just a pro-Brexit. He never gave a firm position on Brexit. He literally always ran away. He always fucking ran away from, uh, from giving like an actual position, which fucked him. People were like, what do you mean you don't have an official position? Which is ironic because it's like, like that shit literally, <laughs> that was the correct position, okay? Being a somewhat of a euro skeptic while simultaneously thinking that it's good to have this kind of like trade it's good to have this kind of trade and like free freedom of movement uh for the uk which was able to carve out its own very specific uh eu deal anyway and was like pretty much autonomous regardless like that was it, it was it was the dumbest thing to do luckily his brexit minister helped him come up with good brexit policies that minister's name keir starmer all of this should be anti-EU. That doesn't mean Brexit was good, though. No, dude, dude, dude. The European Union is bad, but, like, you know, the European Union is a, obviously a mechanism to, to reinforce neoliberalism in the entirety of the European Union. Having said that, however, this kind of collaboration, this kind of collaboration amongst European countries is a fucking absolute must. That's ridiculous, okay? 
So EU on principle is not a bad concept. Like, it's ridiculous. EU in its application is bad, but EU on principle is unironically a, a necessary thing. Like, I, I don't know. I just, uh, let's continue. In large amounts from very small donations from a very large number of people. Since then, party membership is much smaller and much more money yeah, comes EU from- Yeah, EU is not inherently harmful like NATO. I will say that. Like, I'm much more anti-NATO than I am anti-EU. Very wealthy donors. The democracy in the Labour Party has been under sustained attack. Many Labour Party members have been suspended or expelled. Local parties have often been denied the right to choose the candidate they want. And despite promises that were made, candidates have been imposed on people in constituencies. Democracy is not always easy. It's often complicated, but it's more important and more vital than the headline of tomorrow or the ease of somebody sustaining their power today. I joined the Labour Party as a young man in 1966 and I frequently disagreed with the party's policies. For example, over the strategy on the Vietnam War of the Wilson government of that time. I disagreed with Tony Blair on the war in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and on his proposal to increase student fees. I wasn't expelled from the party, I wasn't suspended from the party. I was recognized as having a legitimate voice along with a large number of other people. If you start shutting down dissent and preventing people from speaking out, it's not a sign of strength, it's a sign of weakness. A sign of strength is when you can absorb and listen to the other person's arguments. I want to see the end of the Tory government. This Tory government that has presided over this enormous growth in inequality within our society. Working class communities are about 20% worse off than they were at the time of the great crash of 2008, nine. And this government that has persisted with so much draconian legislation, police law and others, which try to shut down the right of dissent and the right of protest. But what has become more depressing is the growing sympathy between the two front benches on economic strategy in our society. If I'm in parliament, and the government comes forward to put more money into the National Health Service, I'll be right behind them. If they want to put more resources into education and end the stress of testing, I'll be right behind them. But if they come forward with an economic strategy which further enriches the very richest in our society and further impoverishes the poorest in our society, then I will be speaking up against them and speaking up for a society based on social justice, based on need, and a world based on peace and environmental sustainability. Being a member of parliament is an enormous privilege. And in parliament, it means being prepared to take up causes that are sometimes- He's also hot, he's always been hot. Not popular. I was involved from the very beginning in the campaign for the innocence of the Guildford Four. Four young people who were disgracefully imprisoned on life sentences for a crime they did not commit. I'm a, I'm a Corbyn gooner, 100%. I'm a gooner. I'm a gooner for Corbyn. It wasn't very popular to take up that cause, but over years, we eventually won that cause and they were released. Being a member of parliament is lots of long hours and hard work. I'm not afraid of that. This election is obviously a very important one and defeating the Tory government is very important. But there's many diverse forces that are opposing this conservative government all kinds of political alliances will arise after the election. I say to socialists all over the country, stick to your principles, carry on campaigning in all the social justice and peace causes you do, and also participate in the election so you can advance the ideas of a socialist society. To the people of Islington North, thank you for your support. Thank you for all you've taught me over the years. It is a wonderful community, cohesive, united, determined to bring about social justice. Yes, we have huge issues to deal with, but we deal with those together. And it's my joy to work with all of our communities, in our community centers, in our schools, on our housing estates, and bring about a better world. Our campaign, and it is ours, not just mine. When you hear him speak and the love that you feel for him, you have to also remember like, 
Dude, imagine how people felt about like Lenin. You know what I mean? Like, imagine how people felt about Ho Chi Minh. Imagine how fucking people felt about Tito. Like, these are because, like, think about it. If you not everybody is gonna align with the, their opinions, okay? But like, imagine how people felt about Che or Fidel Castro. Like, can you, dude? Being a socialist. Being a follower of Castro in Cuba at that time, you're like, oh my God, the world is the greatest. This is the greatest opportunity of all time. You will never, ever, you will, of course, of course, look at, no, he's nowhere near Lenin. Man, shut up. That's not the comparison I'm making. I'm trying to help people understand through contemporary politics, like why there's so much idolization of like former socialist leaders. Okay, because those are the guys who actually also got shit done. They didn't get shafted and, and uh, destroyed. This also demonstrates why there's so much like um, idolization of figures like this that remains throughout time, especially if people were alive back then. Okay, that's the point. For the general election is going to be people powered. Check it out on votecorbin.com and join in. Together, grassroots politics here in Islington North We'll get into Westminster. Anyway, yeah, I saw the I saw the photos, the zoom in on my marrow. Vote for um, Corbin on Islington. Fuck, man. England could have had it all, dude. They could have reliably had it all. But what did they have? Oh, by the way, Donald Trump is, of course, uh, you know, glazing Nigel Farage. I mean, we haven't even talked about this fucking piece of shit. Nigel Farage. Congratulations to Nigel Farage on his big win of a parliament seat amid reform UK election success. Nigel is a man who truly loves his country, DJT. You know, just a little international fascist collaboration. Um, we already talked about Keir Starmer receiving fewer votes than Jeremy Corbyn did in both 2017 and 2019. Um, and also, the other incredibly damning aspect of this election is the fact that the Conservatives got 6.7 million views, 119 seats. And reform got 4 million views. Reform is literally a fascist party. Okay? Do not let any single person try to steer you in a different direction. Oh, so you said views? Oh, my God. Votes. Fuck. My brain is so broken. I'm a content creator. Okay? I'm a content creator. I'm a content creator. I'm stupid. Okay? Shut the fuck up. I'm a view count Andy. Listen to me. Listen to me. Let's get back. Let's get back to some serious shit. Okay. Four million British people went out and were like, oh, the fucking fascist lad, I like it. Okay. That is crazy. That is crazy. Don't just look at the seat number. You have to look at the fact that reform got second place. Okay. Reform got second place. In 98 districts, 98, okay? No, not third. I'm telling you, this is, oh my God. It is so fucked up. It is so bad. Yeah, it's the British Union of Fascists. Exactly. They are literally, they are that. That's what they are, okay? Anyway, support for the hard right surged. Conservatives went from 43.6%. Hard right reform got a 14.3% boost. Labor up by, uh, from 32.2 to 33.8, like a very modest increase at a time when like the conservative is, uh, they're tanking. Labor center left, lol. I mean, it's, it's insane that it is a center left party. 2% to 14%, dude. Ed Ingramentum says a dead dog would be leading the Tories by 20 points. The only thing that Labour's dipshit campaign has done is let reform surge. Anyway, yeah, I got the full New York Times article. Thank you for uh, sharing it, by the way. Thank you for giving me a free article, Chatter, and anyone else who clicks on it. Uh, what does Labour's landslide mean for UK's political future? Now, all number of electoral records have been broken today, and there are a lot of statistics to digest. But when you give each constituency in the UK equal visual weight, it really lays bare the enormous shift we've seen from the 2019 election to now. Well, I'm joined now by Alistair Campbell, who worked for Tony Blair. He's now a podcaster who writes children's books about democracy. So Craig Oliver, who worked for David Cameron, and... <laughs> <laughs> that's such a funny thing to do dude that is 
That's that's awesome. My man writes children books about fucking democracy now. Liz that's Lloyd, sick. who worked for Nicola Sturgeon in the Scottish government. Alistair Campbell first. This idea of loveless landslide, a term coined by our political editor Gary Gibbon, a, a vote against the Tories but not for Keir Starmer, does that store up problems for the future? Well, look, it is a fact that people wanted to get rid of the Tories, but there had to be a viable alternative, and that was the difference between today and four years ago. The country sees a viable alternative. And loveless or not, a win is a win, and a landslide is a landslide, and a big majority is the opportunity to deliver the kind of change that Labour are talking about. So I don't buy all this stuff that this is some sort of, you know, Pyrrhic victory. It's a huge victory. He's only the fourth person who's led Labour from opposition into... I just want to show you some. Alastair Campbell proposed legal threat to the BBC amid Iraq war coverage row. Files reveal government papers released to the National Archives show animosity between broadcaster and number 10 Downing Street in the early 2000s. The former number 10... Spin doctor Alistair Campbell suggested setting lawyers on the BBC, while Tony Blair was warned to expect a magisterial rebuke from senior figures at the broadcaster as the row over its coverage of the war in Iraq intensified in the early 2000s, government papers show. So, Alistair Campbell is what the thick of it is based on, which is what Veep is based on. It's written by Armando Iannucci, who I really like. Uh, Death of Stalin is another uh, work of his. And wait, what? Biden is live? What the fuck? Oh, no, it's a campaign event. It's teleprompter shit. I don't care about that. Anyway, the funniest thing is like, the funniest thing about this person and their career is that they are, they're like our version of like Brett Stevens, David Frum. David Frum and Brett Stevens, like those guys, okay? It, it's just like, now he's writing children's books about democracy. It's sick. Thanks, man. <laughs> like like he went he went from he went from at his his strong advocacy work in killing iraqi children and threatening the bbc for covering it a little bit to uh to writing books for kids anyway majority government and he's now got a mandate for change well, Sir Craig Oliver, absolute catastrophe for the Tories. Do you see any leadership candidate capable of rebuilding the Tory party, or is it over? I mean, Jacob Rees-Mogg just said on this programme that Boris Johnson should be a contender. Look, there'll be endless people mouthing off in the next day or so about who they think should be doing what. And I think that the thing the Conservative Party needs to do is just take a little bit of time and reflect. And perhaps that's the last service um, or great service that Rishi Sunak can do to the Conservative Party, which is stay on as leader, allow them some breathing space, take stock and not take rash decisions immediately. Mm. Um, well, Liz <laughs> Lloyd, I just wonder if you could tell us how the SNP comes back from that. The same sort of question that I just asked Sir Craig, really. Is this an existential problem for the SNP? I don't think so, no. But I think they do need to take some time. And as Craig has just said for the Conservatives, they need to reflect on why the result was what it was tonight, why they couldn't capture the disaffection with the Tories, why it all went to Labour, um, which is a lot to do with government. It's partly to do with the mess the party's been in over the year. And I think it's also that people aren't quite sure what the SNP, aside from independence, is standing for at the moment. It, it, was, it was a vote against the SNP's record, wasn't it? I think in part, yeah, it was mainly a vote against the Tories. That anti-Tory vote could have come to the SNP if people hadn't also been judging the SNP's record in government and the difficulties the parties had over the last year, which, mm. you know, didn't put it in the best position to capture those votes. Alistair Campbell, we heard Sir Keir Starmer talk repeatedly about service. Mm. I mean, do you think he could surprise us with his radicalism? Might he take some tough decisions, some brave decisions early on? Would you advise him to do that? I would, because I think that the this early... Yeah. When he says brave decisions, he means like, I don't know, fucking sending troops to Ukraine or something, okay? I don't think he means like tackling child poverty. What he means is tackling children, okay? Fuck it, let's go back to Afghanistan type shit. He's like, I do not care much for tackling child poverty as much as I care about tackling children. That's right. Immigrant children trying to come here on boats. Imagine a world where Keir Starmer is wearing boxing gloves, ready to go, 
Have at it, Hoss, he says. Tackling them like Boris Johnson did. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> tackling kids like Boris at the football field. <laughs> uh. ...of his premiership, he's going to have enormous power. The power of the majority, the power of the office, and I think you're already seeing that. I was noticing when I was on Channel 4 last night, the live audience watching Keir Starmer speaking, they were watching him in a different way to how they might have done the day earlier because he is now the Prime Minister. And I think when you say that growth is the number one mission, just take housing, take planning reform. I mean, it's, this is the first... Oh, yeah, here it is. Here it is. We, this is a Hasanabi classic. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Are you okay? yeah, I'm sorry. That's awesome. That's so sick. First time I can remember a campaign where a party has put planning reform at the heart of its campaign. They've now got to do that, and that will be difficult. We live in a NIMBY country. We're going to have to, t we're going to, have to change that because people are going to have to face some very difficult constituencies, including... Wait, did he just say we live in a NIMBY country? Did he just unironically use the term NIMBY? Am I... Am I... Is he using not in my backyard as a terminology? Yo, that is a podcaster. Okay, no, now I get it. No, he's literally just a podcaster. Okay. That's a pot. That's the most that he's not wrong, but it's just wild to hear the term NIMBY being used as a term that everybody fucking understands as a term that everybody fucking understands, like as though like everyone got what you meant. Okay. He is such a fucking podcaster. Oh my God. To the campaign. They've now got to do that. And that will be difficult. We live in a NIMBY country. We're going to have to, we're going to have to change that because people are going to have to face. Yeah, I know. Okay. So he's the one who has the podcast with Rory. Okay. Now a lot of this is starting to make sense. A lot of this is starting to make sense because I see clips from that podcast all the time. That's the reason why people think Rory is like brilliant because they're doing so much on TikTok. <laughs> NIMBY nonces in my backyard. What the fuck does NIMBY mean? Yes. Um, it is not exactly a... It is so obviously not a mainstream concept that there's motherfuckers in this community that they don't know. Okay, reconnection successful. Okay, we're back. We're back. We did it. We did it. You all kept calm and carried on on this joyous occasion. You all won. That's right. We kept calm and we carried on. And for that, we are back. Anyway, a NIMBY is not in my backyard. A person who opposes development, specifically housing. Okay. Either because they don't want their property. They don't want their, their um, cost, like their, their uh, housing uh, value to go down because there's more supply. Okay. Or a person that opposes it because... Um, a person that opposes development because, like, they're just annoyed that it's going to, you know, make a lot of noise and stuff. You're not even mad. I'm proud of you. Yeah. It's because I've given up. And it's my last night here. So I just don't personally, I don't personally care that much. It's okay. Like, it is what it is. It, it basically, like, I, I'm almost certain I have a fucking 40K viewership this week if I wasn't in Croatia. And I've given up on the, on that notion there's like not much i can do about it you know it is what it is i'm coming home just like england a lot of that stuff matters you know i you can't expect people to like um losing viewers yeah exactly here like i'm losing viewers by banning them one by one um it is uh it is what it is people people just go all right fuck this like you know this guy effed i'm done let's continue it's very difficult constituencies, including in their own constituencies. So he could be unexpectedly radical on planning in particular, do you think? Well, I mean, I think he, I think he could be radical on all sorts of fronts. I think there's a really interesting... Tom Baldwin's book about Keir Starmer, I think there's a really interesting narrative in there. Every stage of his career, he's kind of been underestimated, constantly written off, and then over-delivers. And he's done it through his legal career, he's done it through his political career to become the leader of the Labour Party in next to no time. And I suspect he will do it as Prime Minister in very difficult circumstances. Well, advise the Tory party in the way that Alistair Campbell's just advised the Labour Party. How do they deal with Farage? Well, look, I think that they've got to first and foremost recognise that this was a punishment election. It's pretty clear that it was a referendum on this Conservative oh, Party. I, and the oh, I think they recognise it. <laughs> I think it's pretty hard not to recognise that. I mean, that's like... The entire country's like, fuck off, mate. 
British people off, went lad. out of their way to find ways to vote against them. And I think what it proved is, look, you can't do party gate, you can't do the mini budget, you can't tell people you're going to slash net migration and see it double, and then expect people to listen to you. So I think that what the Conservative Party's got to do is realise the mistakes it made. Also, look, take but a lesson. invite Farage into the fold? No, it? I think they need to take a lesson from the, from the Labour Party not so long ago. I fucking called it. Oh, my Lord. Hold on. We're going to run that back. I said this yesterday. I said this verbatim. I said this this morning, earlier, when I first started. I said this. I'm sorry. I'm not the best fucking... I'm not the most brilliant person, okay? I'm not the most well-read person. But I got some good-ass political instincts, okay? This is precisely what I told you last night was going to happen. And I think what it proved is, look, you can't do party gate, you can't do the mini budget, you can't tell people you're going to slash net migration and see it double, and then expect people to listen to you. So I think that what the Conservative Party's got to do is realise the mistakes it made. Also, look, take but a lesson. invite Farage into the fold? No, it? I think they need to take a lesson from the, from the Labour Party. Yeah, they need to take a lesson from the, the Macron party, okay? They need to do what Macron did. The longest serving conservative MP, Sir Edward Lay, says the party needs to invite reform. I would absolutely welcome Farage. Join us. If he wants to stand for leader, that would be a matter for our members. Dude, I, I'm telling you, dude. I'm telling you, dude. I'm telling you, dude. They're doing it. They're doing it. They're doing it. I know how these cretins work. Okay? I know how these fucking creatures operate. I know how cowardly they are. And I know how disgusting they are. I know the moral rot. He actually said take a lesson from labor, though. Yes, dude. He's saying labor capitulate. He's David Cameron's fucking advisor, dude. Of course, he's saying, look, labor won because he capitulated because labor capitulated to the fucking right. OK, so that's what he's now saying is what the conservatives should do to reform, which is completely undermining everything. That is the other thing that I called when I said they are going to make it seem as though Keir Starmer won with this popular broad mandate because he's a center-right figure. So long ago, they were trying to suggest a revolutionary socialist should be our prime minister, but Keir Starmer tacked back towards the center. That's how he showed people that he was elected. And I fear that the Conservative Party, it's just too easy to say that you add the reform vote to the Conservative There you go. No, he's, he's saying that Keir Starmer, Keir Starmer retriangulated to the center-right, which is false, okay? That's a falsehood. Now what he's going to say, now he's going to say, we got to take some of the initiatives that the Reform Party is putting forward and uh, adopt them as our own, which they did. Rishi Sunak did that, and he still got cumstered, so. Vote, and therefore you're going to magically get ahead of the Labour Party. Elections are won in a much more central position. Wait, so which contender best represents that? Because a lot of the centrists have lost their seats, haven't they? Well, look, to, if I'm honest, I'm struggling to see. I wouldn't be... I'd be interested, I think, to, if some people try and throw Jeremy Hunt into the ring. Um, the reason I say that is that I think that they think he's a calm... Never mind, he's saying the opposite. He's saying that the centre-right needs to go to the centre. But he started off the conversation by talking about immigration. I mean, it's an idiotic assessment regardless. But he literally started by talking about how, um, of course, like people are angry at conservatives because of immigration. What is this? Interesting. This guy opposed the anti-BDS bill that was a part of a group of a Jewish lawyers who called on Israel to obey international law, replacing em Emily Thornberry, who refused to say if Israel was breaking it or not. Richard Hermer has been appointed attorney general. He will attend cabinet. Damn. Okay. No, you were right. It's just with a right wing position. He's now calling a centrist position. It is a good appointment. Yeah. Conflating Jewish with Zionists? No, dude. No. You're misunderstanding everything that this person is saying. Okay? He's saying eight Jewish lawyers in the UK, him being one of them, called on Israel to obey international law. Okay? In a situation like that, especially in the UK, it's important to mention that because it's a it's a the easiest way to fucking deflect away from anti-Semitism accusations because, like, you know, they're Jewish. They are critical of Israel. Like, this is a good thing. This is actually a good appointment. A very good appointment, seemingly. It's not like a, it's not like a name the Jew style situation. Keir Stalin is here. Doubters out. Yeah, that's right, dude. That's, that's what's happening, boys. It's happening. Keir Stalin. He's, he's going to do it to the gulags, dude. Secret socialist. He actually was like super anti-Israel across the board.
Yeah, he's like, he's like, I ousted. He comes out and he says, I ousted Jeremy Corbyn because he wasn't positive enough on Hezbollah. Okay. He's like, I've already secured weapons contracts with Hezbollah. I have Hassan Nasrallah on speed dial. I'm sending him British ships. Okay. The Lebanese Navy is going to be the Hezbollah Navy. Do you understand? The reason why I kicked out Corbin was because he wasn't radical enough on Israel. Uh, he's he's immediately doing BDS. <laughs> the, the, the people would go for that, I don't know. But and he look, worked his socks off in that he did campaign, work, didn't he? He worked his socks off in this campaign. But look, I think you're going to see Kemi Badenoch having a go. You're going to see Pretty Patel having a go, James Cleverly. There's going to be a lot of people out there. Farage is coming for you, isn't he? He's made that clear today. Well, not well, you personally, but... Yeah, he didn't want his party showing support for the trade unions because he was secretly in talks with them to gift them the train companies. Yeah, he was like, don't fuck up the bag, okay? Why else would Mick Lynch support labor after all? Think about that, okay? That's right, because Mick knew Keir Stalin was actually nationalizing rail, okay? Creating workers' councils specifically for rail. He's nationalizing it and he's giving it back to the fucking railroad workers, dude. Trust the plan. Trust the process. Keir Stalin, he's coming, dude. I suppose you'd like to. Look, I think that you can't write off Nigel Farage, and reform did come second in lots of places. But I think that you cannot beat Farage at his own game. You can't out Farage Farage. Populism has never worked. He is a creature of populism. He is somebody who doesn't see policies as being there to solve challenges and problems. Yeah, this is like, this is also, ironically, every media elite guy, no matter which country you go to, is this like annoying technocratic neoliberal, okay? Oh, populism does not work. It's like, dude, what are you talking about? Look at reform. They got 4 million votes. What the fuck do you mean populism doesn't work? Right populism is just racism, okay? Left populism is socialism. It literally works. One works in a good direction. The other works in a dire direction, in a devastating direction. Care to guess which side these neoliberals inevitably lean on in terms of populism? Is there to exploit them. Labour has to show it can, ex it can solve the problems the country's facing, including the problems that he exploits. And that's the only way to do this. Liz Lloyd, in a way, you're the populist that became the incumbents, and now you're getting punished for being the incumbents. Is independence now off the table, or are there independent supporting Labour supporters who could provide a way forward for you? Yes, those people could provide a way forward, but I think in the short term it is off the table. And that's something that actually the public already know. It's one of the reasons why independence wasn't a successful rallying cry in this campaign, is that people know it's not happening, certainly this side of the 2026 Holyrood elections. But there were a lot of people who will have voted Labour last yeah. night. Yeah, <laughs> populism never works, said former EU member state. Yeah, classic. Populism, so such a failure, dude. It's just, populism, such a failure. Nigel Farage is now like, Nigel Farage now has momentum, like. Who are independent supporters and who will be looking at the Hollywood election differently. Scottish voters are used to changing their mind between elections. They're used to using their votes quite cleverly in elections. So, you know, this was a very good night for Labour in Scotland. I'll not take that away from them. But the contest, if you like, starts again today, tomorrow, um, for the Scottish Parliament election with the parties on more or less equal standing. Alistair Campbell, Keir Starmer sort of nodded to the fact that, you know, there was a disgruntlement with politicians of all parties, um, and that was reflected in the turnout figures. What do you do about that? You have to rebuild trust. I mean, and I think he's made a very good start on that by putting this concept of public service, I and mean, it's ridiculous he even has to, but after the last few years, that is necessary to show that you have a cabinet there, MPs there. There's going to be so many new MPs coming in. That would be like a breath of fresh air through that. Point. And a very working class cabinet. Very working class cabinet, which I think is a good thing per se. Most state educated uh, cabinet we've, we've ever had. I think just picking up something there that Liz said, this issue of tactical voting, I think one of the reasons Labour's vote is where it is, there were an awful lot of Labour people who voted Lib Dem yesterday mm. because they understood that the getting the Tories out. Beautiful British summer day ass. Oh, yeah. This is the, the least wet British summer day, dude. The least humid. The least humid, most sunny British summer day. So funny. Dude, honestly, though, if you've ever been to England and it's actually sunny out, 
I'm telling you, is one of the most OP places on the planet. It's like God had to punish them. It would literally be, England would be the top destination, one of the top destinations, if it was always sunny. I'm not even joking. It almost makes you, fe it makes you forget. It makes you forget how shitty everything is. It, it's not even a question. It is so beautiful, dude. Play with walkability and good trains. I mean, I'm American. British public transit is literally fucking incredible in comparison to anything I can get here in the United States of America. So you're complimenting England. Are you okay? I mean, I've, I've had this position before. I've talked about this before. So important. So I think there was an awful lot of tactical voting. But now Labour has the opportunity to show it can govern, to show the values that Keir Starmer has been talked about are real and can deliver and see off Farage. Yeah. Briefly, same question to you. How do you deal with this disgruntlement, a plague on all your houses? Well, look, the, the a big hope for the Conservative Party is that the... Do you see the American Olympics team is importing their own AC units because the French ones are so shit? Dude, that's not even a joke. That, like, is sound. That's crazy to me. Yeah, of course, dude. They should do that. That's... I would do that. I will do that in the future. I need two things. I need my own fucking, like, broadband somehow. No matter where I go, no matter how I travel to the European Union countries or just Europe in general, I need my own fucking internet and I need my own AC. These motherfuckers just don't have that, okay? They just don't have that. How are you liking Croatia? Croatia is beautiful. You guys live in a fucking... You guys live in castles and shit. It's pretty crazy. Um, the internet has not been kind to me, though, here. I'm, I, I hate it, you know? Every time I serve a three-minute average at the top of the hour, my shit cuts out. It's pretty bad. But such is life. Life is life. At the top of the hour, there's a three-minute average. If you no longer want to see the ads, all you need to do is subscribe for $5 or for free. Why would you go to Croatia with my family? Family vacation. Family vacation. Family vacation. Family vacation. To fuck your mom. That's why I went. I'm lying. I went because I took your mom out and I had sex with her on a boat. All right. It remains as volatile as it's shown it's been over the last couple of weeks. That they can hope that they can turn this around. Keir Starmer did it in a parliament. They think they might be able to. And I do think that Alistair makes a good job of saying how well Labour have done. Of course they've done well. But it's looking a bit a mile wide and an inch deep. And it was a pretty lacklustre campaign. They let the Conservative parties destroy themselves. They didn't do a brilliant job in enthusing people. And very briefly, Liz Lloyd, same question to you about how do you enthuse disgruntled voters? Shit, my food is here. All right. We're going to do Tom Nichols, how Britain became a poor country right now. But before that, let's hear what Brandon is saying and doing. Never mind. He's out. He's done. Here is 10 Downing Street, the official residence of the British Prime Minister. On Wednesday, the 22nd of May, 2024, then Prime Minister Rishi Sunak walked out that front door and announced that he was calling a general election. On paper, it perhaps wasn't the worst political speech ever. It recalled some of the support that Sunak had provided to workers and small businesses during the COVID pandemic, and threw a bit of shade at Keir Starmer, his opponent in the upcoming vote. In practice, though, Sunak cut a pretty pathetic figure. Propped up by a lectern as the rain pelted him from above, someone kept knocking the camera, meaning the official broadcast of this historic moment just looked kind of amateurish. Worse still, a protester in the adjoining street had set up a PA system and started blasting Things Can Only Get Better, a song by One Hit Wonder's D-Ream, which had previously been used as an election anthem by the Labour Party. Watching Sunak try to win the affections of the British people, whilst being both metaphorically drowned out by an anthem of his political opponents, and literally drowned out by some good old-fashioned British precipitation, felt rather fitting for a Prime Minister whose tenure had been, honestly, kind of forgettable. It was even more apt for a political party, the Conservative Party, whose 14-year rule over the UK has left the country in tatters. Poorer, nastier, with crumbling schools, bankrupt cities, polluted waterways, and the highest housing-to-income ratio since the Victorian era. On aggregate, the UK remains one of the richest countries in the world, but it rarely feels that way anymore. Ask anyone that lives here, and they'll attest to the fact that everything is just hideously expensive now. Our politics is pretty openly corrupt and chaotic, and the country has been gripped by a general sense of malaise, an understanding that 
everything is just kind of bad. But how did we get here? How did a country which used to be a pioneer in science, technology, art, and education come to have human poo floating down its rivers? And how do we come back from this? This is the story of how the British Conservative Party subjected its own country to three separate yet interconnected experiments, each of which would tear away a different part of the country's political, social and economic fabric. This is the story of how Britain became a poor country. This is David Cameron. On the 11th of May 2010, David Cameron enters 10 Downing Street for the first time. England always saw poo in the river, let's be real. Yes and no. They did, and they handled it, and then they fucked it up again. Yes. Poo in the, in the they, them's river has always been a fucking major issue. Except they privatized it. And of course, when they did that, the, the private corporations did not take the necessary precautions. Because why the fuck would they? There's also no regulation on it because it's like glad handling. Glad handing? Like it's like friendly businesses that they gave it to. As the newly elected Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. His election win hasn't been a particularly convincing one. The party Cameron leads, the Conservatives, have only managed to win 306 seats in the House of Commons. That's 20 seats short of an outright majority. Claiming the top spot has thus required him to go cap in hand to this guy, Nick Clegg, the leader of the UK's notionally centrist Liberal Democrat Party. After five days of negotiations, Cameron and Clegg have agreed to form a coalition government, in which Cameron will serve as Prime Minister and Clegg as his deputy. Coalition governments in which multiple parties come together to govern collaboratively are exceptionally rare in the UK. The last time this happened was during the 1930s and 1940s, when all the major parties in Parliament came together to present a united front during the Second World War. As David Cameron crosses the threshold of number 10, however, he perhaps feels like this collaborative arrangement might serve him well. See, David Cameron is, at this point at least, a genre of centre-right politician which would soon go wildly out of fashion. He's certainly a great supporter of typical conservative causes such as tax cuts, privatisations and reductions in welfare spending, but he's also desperate to at least present himself as youthful, environmentally conscious and broadly socially liberal. Some of this social liberalism is perhaps sincere. As Prime Minister, he'll soon push for the UK to adopt equal marriage, despite solid opposition from other Conservatives. He'll also lead a revolution in offshore wind and had already managed to promote greater gender equality among political candidates within his Bro, I mean, things have gotten much worse in general, but it's just something to remember that, like, this is why it's not even a question about, like, American Republican Party versus the Conservative Party in the UK. Party. Although, this being the 2000s, the British press had soon christened them Cameron's cuties. Which, yeah. Perhaps more suspect is the idea which sits at the centre of Cameron's vision for Britain, the Big Society. The Big Society is intended, in part, as a corrective to that eternal conservative bogeyman of big government. Cameron's pitch is that he's going to empower individuals, charities and community groups to take a more active role in civic life. In its opposition to big government, however, the Big Society doesn't stop at cutting red tape and government oversight. All that charity work is intended to make up for a brutal programme of cuts to public services. It's fair to say that the UK's finances aren't exactly in the best of shape at this point. This is just two years after the global financial crisis of 2008, and the country is still very much dealing with the aftermath. In order to prevent the complete collapse of the country's banking and housing sectors, the previous government has paid to effectively nationalise two banks and shelled out to buy significant ownership stakes in two more. A fall in real terms earnings, along with people being more cautious with how they spend their money, means tax receipts have also taken a hit. The state of affairs is perhaps best captured by a handwritten note left by Labour's outgoing Chief Secretary of the Treasury to his successor, which reads simply, Dear Chief Secretary, I'm afraid there is no money. Best regards and good luck. Over the next five years, Cameron references this note often. He sometimes waves it about at campaign events. 
Not only does the memo help to portray Cameron's political rivals in the Labour Party as having a carefree attitude when it comes to taxpayer cash, the notion that the country is flat broke provides a rationale for taking a pretty uncompromising approach to cutting government spending. As things stand, the UK government is running a budget deficit of £150 billion. Cameron and his government unveil a plan to cut that number as quickly as possible. It doesn't matter that interest rates are at their lowest since 1694 and that the cost of the government's borrowing is effectively zero. Cameron and Osborne want to slash the size of the state. And there has perhaps never been a better excuse to do so. The package of spending cuts implemented over the next few years includes reforms to the wealth. Tell the Club channels not to upload your reaction to this video. Tom Nichols has criticized your fan channels in the past and said he doesn't want them to upload your reactions to his work. It's pretty funny that you are mentioning this as though I don't fucking personally talk to Tom or I haven't had a personal conversation with Tom. Like, you know better, dude. You know better. Thanks. What are we doing? Half a chat is fucking demanding. I explain. Half a chat is demanding. I explain what the fuck food I'm eating and explain like the, the every bite individually. And the other half is like, oh, bro, what the fuck? Uh, don't upload this video. Why are you reacting to this video? No, I've talked about, I've talked with Tom on stuff like this. As long as you're not fucking cutting the video's momentum, it's fine. It's a case by case basis for the most part. But like, anyway, Hassan's least defensive reaction to a chatter. I just, uh, you know, I've, I've been pretty good today. I haven't had a short fuse, but I'm just like starting to get a little annoyed. A system which make it harder for disabled people and sick people to access support. It involves a 13% cut in funding for schools and colleges, as well as a 40% cut to funding for universities, made up for by shifting the burden of tuition costs onto students through a tripling of fees. Anyone working in the public sector has their pay frozen for two years, and subsequent annual pay rises capped at 1%. Police funding, defense spending, and public transport spending all receive swinging cuts, whilst the Royal Mail, the UK's postal service, is sold off to investors at a bargain basement price. It's hard to get across in just a short section of one video quite how wide-ranging Cameron, Clegg, and Osborne's attack on public spending is. There's not a single part of British public life that goes untouched. And judged on its own terms, it's pretty successful. By 2015, the deficit has dropped by more than a third. Nevertheless, the effects on the economy and country more broadly are mixed. Throughout the five years of the coalition government, George Osborne repeatedly tells Brits that, quote, we're all in this together when it comes to this attempt to fix public finances. Nevertheless, the pain of austerity is felt strongest by the poorest in society. In fact, at the same time as work for ordinary people is becoming more precarious and less well paid, corporation tax, the tax paid by companies on their profits, is gradually brought down from 28% to just 20%. By 20 I love fixing the deficit. Why don't you like people? What, what's so wrong with people asking what you're eating? You're an influencer. I think it's important for someone with a platform to share parts of their lives with their fans, like the top of the hour ad break. Bro, I already ran it. Day off. Day off. I already ran it. <clears throat> no double baits like that. Bro's losing his mind over a sandwich? Yeah. No double baits. That was a double bait. He kept asking me what kind of sandwich I have so that I could pull him up. In 15, the grim reality of Cameron's big society is evident in the rise of food banks. Five years ago, food banks had been essentially non-existent in the UK. The country's most prominent food bank charity had handed out just 40,000 packages that entire year. But by 2015, that figure has risen to more than 1 million. The result of Cameron's policies, then, is not some utopian empowerment of local communities, but one in which people who previously could have found support and guidance in the welfare system becoming reliant on charity to feed themselves and their families. Perhaps unsurprisingly, as the impact of Cameron and Clegg's cuts begin to be felt, there's a sense that these policies might not be super popular amongst the general public. 
The coalition years are beset with protests and strikes and demonstrations by various groups affected by the austerity regime. And if it's easy to disregard such activists as a vocal minority, the notion that UK voters might be experiencing a touch of buyer's remorse quickly becomes evident in the polls too. By the end of 2010, the Labour Party is- It's so funny because they, they did this and then for 14 years, they did this, and then for 14 years, they kept voting in Tories. It's great. <laughs> Someone in the chat said, I know, I can't I'm going to claim. Exactly. It is a bit similar. It is an, it is an experience I know well from Turkey. They've taken Cameron's Conservatives in the polls, a lead they maintain consistently for the next four years. The right-wing press mercilessly lampooned the Labour Party leader, Ed Miliband, for his slightly meek, awkward aura, including through publishing this unflattering photo of him eating a bacon sandwich. Nevertheless, while Labour's polling lead drops, they still retain a slight lead. On the day of the 2015 general election, it looks very much like Cameron might be a one-term wonder. The results are certainly set to be close, but there's a chance that Ed Miliband and the Labour Party might be able to piece together an alternative coalition of smaller parties to oust Cameron and the Conservatives from power. Then, that evening, all those predictions turn out to be false. When the results are counted, the Conservatives turn out not to have lost support, but gained it. <laughs> Their 306 MPs have become 331 enough to end their pact with the Liberal Democrats and govern solo. Everyone involved in the entire polling industry spends the next year or so hanging their heads in shame. Among several proposed reasons for why they got it so wrong is the so-called shy Tory effect. This is the idea that some voters, when asked, will be hesitant to admit that they're going to vote Conservative. Presumably something about not wanting to appear pro-food bank and declining life expectancy or something. In some ways, then... This is something I will never understand. It's like, you understand that the policies... By the way, this literally happened with Donald Trump, too. But you understand that the policies are bad. Why do you want it, then? Why do you vote for it? Like, it's just so fucking stupid. Like you're like, oh, yeah, the party that brought us fucking food banks and austerity, I know they suck, but I'm still going to vote for them, but I'm also embarrassed to admit that. Then don't vote for them. Like, what is wrong with you? What, what the fuck is wrong with your brain? Just don't vote for them, dude. Don't. Don't do that. Just don't even vote. Don't vote. Don't go out and vote. I, I don't get it. Like, I just, oh, my God. People are so fucking stupid. Cameron exits the 2015 general election more confident than ever. He has an outright majority in Parliament and a reassuring sense that there might be greater support for his austerity agenda than there sometimes appears. That confidence is about to- Stop blaming people. Workers are uneducated <laughs> politically and don't have an alternative. That's so funny. I love when socialists are just like, yeah, dude, the workers have intellectual disabilities, dude. Like, don't, don't ever fucking criticize them. You don't understand. They're like babies, okay? They're like adults with baby brains. They're car crash victims. They have John Fetterman brain. Like, thank you for infantilizing the working class, but socialistly, okay? Undercut, however, by a new threat. The rise of the Brexiteers. To understand this next part of the story, we need to take another look at this graph. There's a lot that pollsters got wrong when calculating voting patterns prior to the 2015 general election. But one thing they did spot correctly was a steady rise in support for the UK Independence Party, or UKIP for short. UKIP are a right-wing party who, in 2015, are led by this guy, Nigel Farage. And while they maintain a broad manifesto of policies, their primary mission is to get the- Bro, they just straight up lied about everything. Um, like, the entire Brexit manifesto is just built on straight up lies and it hits so fucking hard people were like oh hell yeah i'm looking for this dumb shit awesome okay to leave the european union which isn't an entirely fringe desire support for the eu has fluctuated constantly since the uk joined the bloc back in the 1970s particularly as a result of its impact on immigration See, under EU rules, citizens of any member state have the right to move to and work in any other member state. 
And since the early 2000s, net migration to the UK from within the EU has been trending further and further upwards. All of the available research suggests that this has a positive impact on the UK economy. But in an era of economic downturn, immigrants have become an easy scapegoat. David Cameron has often joined in on this scapegoating, making high-profile promises to bring net migration down into the tens of thousands. Nevertheless, support for UKIP continues to rise. And in 2014, one of Cameron's own MPs even defects to the party in protest at his perceived inaction on the issue. The result is that Cameron decides that he has to do something in order to avoid losing more support. His solution? To pinch UKIP's own key policy Capitulating to the right, capitulating to fascist right-wingers and their stupid fucking policies. Sure, it'll keep you in power. Well, not you specifically, not maybe just not you specifically, but it's great. They love doing this shit, man. The best decision by a politician in the modern era. Yeah, like historic run for not you specifically. No, I meant for David Cameron specifically. This was the start of a sequence of L's for, I mean, dude. This literally is the starting point of what you saw last night. It wasn't just the austerity. This led to him withdrawing, resigning, whatever. Then afterwards, there was the sequence of other fucking uh, politicians that also, uh, other Tory admins that also fucked up majorly. Most of it framed around Brexit. Well, not the last three, but. Of holding a referendum on EU membership. A nationwide vote presenting Brits with a binary choice, in or out. Cameron's reason for calling the vote is because he feels pretty certain that the Remain campaign is going to win. He wants to prove that whatever concerns might exist around immigration, that wanting to leave the EU is little more than a fringe obsession of a vocal minority. This, of course, is not what happens. The first blow to Cameron's plan comes just a day after he announces the referendum. That afternoon, he receives a text message from this guy, Boris Johnson. Having been to both school and university with Cameron, Johnson had previously been something of an ally. But in his message that morning, Johnson declares whatever truce there might have been between them to be over, and says that he'll be throwing his full weight behind the Leave campaign. Johnson soon emerges as the Leave team's de facto leader. And agitating to leave the EU turns out to be a whole lot easier than campaigning to stay in. It might be that all the available evidence suggests that staying a member of the European Union is the more prosperous economic choice for the UK. Explaining why is kind of boring and technocratic. Whatever the evidence suggests, it's just kind of difficult to inspire some kind of deep adoration for a somewhat bureaucratic trading bloc. The Leave campaign by... It's also infinitely easier to fucking lie. In many ways, the Brexit campaign, once again, wasn't just about leaving because Polish people were coming in. It was about leaving because Polish people were taking your jobs. Even if they didn't actually take your fucking jobs, right? Um, it was more so about the economic instability that you felt in your heart. And you were like, maybe it's because of a fucking Polish person that I'm feeling this way. But more importantly than that, it literally had refunding the NHS baked into the fucking campaign. I mean, it's an abject lie. Nigel Farage would never fund the NHS. You're out of your fucking mind. But that was what they were claiming. They were like, oh, dude, European Union cost the UK 700 gorillion dollars a day. We could be using that on the NHS. And then people were like, oh, my God, that's so stupid. Why are we giving 700 gorillion dollars to the EU? We should be giving 700 gorillion dollars to the NHS. I like this idea that Nigel Farage is making. Okay. And that's literally like, you have to understand that is a direct way to say like, oh, we should be funding the NHS. Okay. It wasn't gorillion. It was 350 million, which also was a lie, by the way. Yeah. That was also a lie. The fact that the EU is sending 350 million pounds a, a week or that you would fund the NHS with that. Did it get funded? Brexit happened. I think... Yeah, they're, they're too busy f using that, using those funds to fund Israel. Contrast is free to weave a highly emotive narrative, which stitches together a whole range of distinct issues under the banner, take back control. This notion of taking back control is partly about immigration. Yeah, it was just that, that's it. It was because, dude, that's it. 
military aged men. That's it. That's the real reason why they did this shit. Okay, it banged because there are so many goddamn racists. But it also taps into a whole <sighs> range of anxieties about the country's declining influence on the world stage and even cuts to public services, which are reframed as no longer being a political choice made by the Conservative Party, but the result of a need to send great sums of cash to Europe. In fact, the success of the take back control narrative is that voters can kind of project whatever they want onto it. How's Brits to take whatever their frustrations might be with contemporary Britain, no matter whether they are real or relevant, and redirect that anger at the EU? And it works. At 4.40 a.m. on the 24th of June 2024, the BBC announces that Britain has voted to leave the European Union. It was such a laughably massive L for England, dude. Holy shit. Another position that I was absolutely fucking correct on and never, never, not even for a fucking moment, uh, uh, backpedaled on at all. Every single for there were so many leftists who were yelling at me. They were like, well, what about Lexit? What about Lexit? There's a lot of leftists that want to do Brexit, but for different reasons. And I was like, you're fucking wrong and you're stupid. Okay. <laughs> The EU partnership agreement for the UK was already, like, set up in a way that was only beneficial to the UK. Like, imagine imagine having a beneficial trade agreement with your, you know, with your partner right there, with your partner in your ass cheeks. And you're like, you know what, I'm going to fuck this, uh, I'm going to fuck this bag up. I'm sad I didn't want you on TYT back then. I work in construction. I voted for but since Brexit, my wages have doubled. Yeah, they got the polls out, dude. By 51.89% to 48.11%. Throughout the referendum campaign. The one guy that's doing well in the UK. I mean, that's awesome. Get your money up. Get your bag, King. I think your uh, your wages went up. Also, uh, I don't think they adjusted to the fucking cost of living. I suspect that if your wages doubled, your rent is like quadrupled now.